Absolutely, what you want to hear? No, be your Ingrid Zukuk. Good afternoon or greetings, everybody. My name is Ingrid Zukuk, and today I'm going to be talking about my Mellon Public Scholars project for the summer. So the title of my project is Rutsibashik Kachabal, piloting the application of heritage language learning methodologies into Kachika speaking communities in Guatemala. Uh, hi everybody, my name is Ingrid once again. Uh, I am Maya Kachikelen Kerchi. I am originally from Ishimulehu or currently known as Guatemala. And I'm a second year PhD student in Native American Studies here at UC Davis. And uh, a lot of my work and projects are around health and well being and how language is essential uh, to the health and well being of indigenous communities, specifically Maya communities in Ishimulel, as well as those residing in the diaspora. So I also want to introduce uh, my community partners for this project. Um, first and foremost, Matios Chawa, Magda Sots. Um, Maida Sutz was um, the, basically the key person in this project. She is a personal friend, uh, my mentor and my teacher, who has taught me a lot about the reading and writing of our language in the past two years. And she also developed her own um, book on methodologies for the teaching of the Kakchike language in various uh, schools in Guatemala. And so her extensive expertise in how to teach the language was really essential to building this project from the ground. Uh, the other person was uh, Stephen Eyman, my partner and friend, uh, who is a PhD student in linguistics here, also at the University of California, Davis, whose expertise was really, really important for us to consider as we developed our curriculum and our workshop for the summer project. Okay. So to give you a little bit of context and background on what this project was about. So this is um, the country of Guatemala here, what you see on the left. It is the linguistic map that maps out all the languages that are spoken in the country. Guatemala has uh, 25 languages that are currently spoken. 22 of those are Maya languages. And within that, you can see here that the Kakshika community is the one that I'm pointing here, right in the middle. Uh, with uh, this arrow. And although historically, these linguistic map kind of maps out where um, each Maya community resides, obviously for many reasons, we migrate, we move around. So it's not uncommon for Maya's people to speak more than one Maya language, apart from Spanish, which is considered the official language of Guatemala. And then the graph in the middle is from the recent um, statistics of 2018 that uh, kind of show the different Maya communities and how many people identify um, themselves as being belonging to that linguistic group in Guatemala. And what's important here is what I'm pointing with the red arrow, and that is the Cachiquil um, community, linguistic community. And as we can see from this graph, Kachikil is the third most spoken or the most um, known identity in the country of Guatemala. And that's really important for the purposes of this project to see kind of the population that we're talking about and who is affected by this or um, benefiting from this project as well. So from those statistics that we see that approximately 1.68 million people identify themselves as Kachikil. Um, and that's approximately 11% of the population of Guatemala, so it's a pretty significant number. And out of that 1.68 million people, approximately 411,000 uh, or 25% of that 1.68 million say that they learn how to speak Kachikil as their first language. Um, and even though these two statistics are very important because they highlight the density of uh, Kachikil speakers and Kachikil people in the country, there are quite a few things that we do not know about this population. And that first one is that how many of that 1.68 million uh, just speak Kachikil, either as a second or a third language or grew up with the language in relation um, or alongside speaking Spanish, like people like myself. Um, and then the second question is just how many of the people who speak the language know how to read and write it, um, because this is basically the question that I'm trying to answer and the population that I'm trying to reach through this project. So what was my project proposal for the summer? 
so I applied through the Mellon Public Scholars Project because I wanted to be able to um, bring some form of linguistic justice to my community. As I mentioned to you, I am Kakchikel and Kakchi, but I only speak Kakchikel because that's the side of the family that I grew up uh, with. And um, I grew up with my language for as long as I can remember. But when people ask me, or they used to ask me to spell certain things in the language, I couldn't do it. Um, and I'm not the exception. I'm probably actually the rule. The majority of us who grow up speaking Kakchikel or speaking our Maya languages, don't know how to read and write it. And there's obviously historic factors that have gotten us to the place of why so many of our languages have only survived in their um, spoken form, but not in their written form. And those, again, were part of the, of the curriculum that we built for this project. But two years ago, when I first started to learn how to read and write my language, um, the process was really, really a big learning curve for me. Um, and it brought a lot of things with it, including shame and pride and sadness and just a lot of feelings because I didn't quite understand why this was the situation of so many of our community members that we don't know how to read and write our language, right? And so I also felt like the process that I had to go to learn my language and the methodology used was one that is more similar to second language acquisition. So the default being that you already know how to speak Spanish and maybe you want to learn how to speak a Maya language as a second language, which is obviously not the case for 1.68 million people that maybe more than half of that already know how to speak the language, but they what we need is the reading and the writing. So. The project that I proposed was based on heritage language teaching methodologies within the context of the United States. This is obviously a growing field, but a field that looks at a very specific population and their very specific needs. Um, specifically, heritage language learning and teaching is something that's taken off a lot with Spanish speakers, especially children of immigrants in the United States who grew up with the language at home, but they don't necessarily grow up with the skills of learning how to read and write the language, right? And so heritage language teaching methodologies are developed to basically focus on those skills, uh, developing those skills and not necessarily the vocabulary because they already probably have that. And so um, I thought that this was really, really interesting because I think that it's applicable to the context of Guatemala, even though we're speaking about different languages and the histories are obviously different, but I think there's a lot that we can learn from heritage language um, teaching methodologies that might be applicable in the context of Guatemala. So my proposal was that, to take heritage language teaching methodologies, develop a reading and writing learning manual, um, provide a four-hour workshop where we can use the manual and uh, teach Kakshikil speakers how to read and write, and then evaluate um, the students to see where they started, where they are, and what they would like to see in the future, right? And then personally for me, I also wanted to see, is this even a big community need, or maybe it's just something that I think is good? Uh, maybe other community members do too, but it's not necessarily something that um, has been identified as a huge need in our community. So these are pictures from the workshop that we were able to implement. So we, ho we hosted two workshops, one in Zoologia, which is my hometown, and one in Chishot, uh, which is uh, my mentor Magda's hometown. And so the way that we developed the four hour is in one hour kind of hitting the four pillars of what we considered um, the heritage language learning methodology. So the first one was to provide um, cultural and political context. So why are we in the situation that we're in right now where the majority of us know how to speak but don't know how to read or write our language? The second was focusing on the phonology. Uh, so how do you make the sounds and how do you pair them with letters within the alphabet, right? So utilizing the Latin alphabet, but making adaptations to it. Um, and so you can pair the sounds and words that you already know with certain letters, right? Third one was focused on reading. So providing short stories in the Kakchike language so that the students and the participants could look at the language written out and identify within that uh, words that they already know and are familiar with. And then finally, the fourth one was focused on the writing. And so after they did the short lectures and we read the short stories, then we um, read out full sentences, starting with words to full sentences. And the students working in groups of three had to spell it out to see uh, in consultation with each other to see if they were, you know, gaining the skills of reading and writing. 
And then we concluded our four hour workshops by providing a certificate of participation to each of the students. Um, this is something that's very important, especially in Guatemala, because when you're applying for jobs or you're applying for opportunities, um, it's really important that you show that you, you know, take an initiative to participate in different programs that increase your skills. And so uh, this was something that we provided, which was really well received um, uh, for, by the students. And all of them were extremely happy to have participated in the, in the workshops. This is the picture on the right is from our, as we ended our workshop in Chishot in Comalapa in Magda's community. As you can see that picture uh, for me brings me a lot of joy because uh, it's super intergenerational. It's one of the things that we really wanted to keep in our project was to provide opportunities for students and participants of all ages. Um, so when we did the invitation for participants, uh, we left it pretty open. The only criteria was that you needed to be a Kachikan speaker, um, that you could read and write in Spanish, uh, and that you were interested in participating. It could be there for the entire four hours, and that's what the students were able to do. So here I'm going to show you a little bit of the results that we were able to gather from the survey that we provided. Um, so we asked four questions to evaluate uh, the students. So the first Two questions focused on how would you rate your knowledge of Kachike reading and writing before the workshop? And then the second was how would you rate your knowledge after the workshop? So we had 45 participants, so 45 responses. And on average, the students rated their knowledge of reading and writing before at a 4.8 out of 10. After the workshop, the students rated their uh, knowledge at an 8.7. So it's almost a or a full four point jump, which really shows us that the students got it. And we were able to see it because when we were um, you know, calling out numbers or words and full sentences, we could see that the students were starting to write them, um, not necessarily with our help, just on their own and consulting one another. So we could see that they were gaining the knowledge because the vocab is already there. The third question that we asked was, how would you rate the overall usefulness of the training? So we wanted to know, was the structure helpful? Do they understand it? Is it something that they found useful or not? Um, and the average response out of 45 people was a 9.6 out of 10. So this was a huge success because it shows that um, maybe heritage language learning methodologies and the structure that we provided using that methodology was extremely well received by our community members and our participants. And then the final question that we asked was just if they had any suggestions for us to improve the training. Um, so this is a word cloud that kind of takes all of that um, and highlights kind of the bigger responses or the most common responses that students had. This is in Spanish, but just for those of you who um, don't speak Spanish, I have here also the four points that we got the most or heard the most. And the first one is that students were eager for more workshops. They wanted more workshops, more opportunities to learn the reading and the writing. Um, and they wanted to see con continuity of this type of workshop, of this type of initiative. We did inform them that this was a pilot program, so there was no guarantee that this could continue on. But they nevertheless, a lot of them said, we wanted to continue on, right? Whether it's in a different capacity, maybe offering online classes or creating a virtual library. There was a lot of desires from the students to seek uh, continuity. And then the third one was looking at PDF or other written materials. So the students are eager to have access to resources that they can use on their own to continuously read Kachikil, to be able to utilize in their classrooms or in their lives and their families. Unfortunately, the resources are not readily available. And for those ones that are, um, there's a cost to it. And often that's a barrier for a lot of uh, participants. And then finally, the feedback that we saw both in the, um, the form, but also just in conversations that we had with some of the participants at the end was just how empowering it was for them to be able to gain the reading and writing skills in our language. Because I think many of us recognize that this is our heritage, it's our language, it's what makes us who we are as Kachikian people. Um, but not having the ability to read and write it is a big barrier and a limitation to us to feel like we can create, that we can preserve, that we can pass on our language. And so uh, seeing how empowering it was was actually very, very, uh, probably the, one of the biggest success that I think of the project. 
So what's next and kind of some reflections that I have already shared with you. Um, there's so much happening in Guatemala um, right now, especially initiatives from young people, the new generation, um, older leaders as well that really want to continuously ensure that are not only that we survive, the, but that we're thriving, uh, right? So the glyph that you see in the middle is something that I developed um, from um, just my three-month class of my epigraphy, which is the ancient form of writing, which is now also being revitalized and really taking off in Guatemala, where a lot of students and a lot of Kachiquil and Maya people are learning how to write in the ancient way. Um, and here it's spelled out as Kakakatip, which means new writing, um, because this is what we were bringing to our community, right? Right? We're using the Latin alphabet, something that's not ours, but that we can use as a tool and adapt it so that we can uh, start reading and writing our language, right? Um, the other aspect of it is to see, it was really wonderful to see how many younger people were there and also people who brought their children with them because we want to see this uh, as something that is no doesn't just stay within those 45 people, but that they take it out of that and be able to share it with others as well so that we can grow this project into some, something bigger and so that many more people have the capacity to read and write in our language. So with that, um, I just want to do my Matteo Shinik or my expression of gratitude because this project wouldn't have been possible without the support and work of so many people. And so Hanila Matteo Chike, or thank you very much to the following individuals. So first and foremost, Magda Sotz for being my community partner, my mentor, and a dear friend, uh, Hanila Matteo Chawa Magda. Thank you also to Stephen Iman who, for volunteering his time and his knowledge and being a co-facilitator in our project. To the Mellon Public Scholars uh, Program here at UC Davis through the Humanities Institute for selecting me as a Mellon Public Scholar for this year so that I could use um, the scholarship to really implement this project, which has been a very long dream of mine. And I was very happy to see it go to back to my community to Justin Spence, who was my faculty mentor on this project, to Stephanie Moroni for all of her mentorship and also for responding to my many emails as I was abroad. And thank you so much for getting back to me and making this possible. To my Oshlahuch Ach cohort and the summer program, which I was a part of in 2020 and also this year as well, which is where I first learned how to read and write, because that is also where I met my mentor, Magda Sutz, and the many other teachers of that um, program that have continuously helped me and offer so generously their time and their knowledge. And of course, this would not even be possible without my relatives, friends, colleagues, and community members of Tzolojia and Chishot. And with that, um, thank you so much, and I wish you uh, well. Thank you.